So I was one of those people who really enjoyed sports in high school. Uh, I started in junior high and, and actually even before that. And uh, every fall I would run cross country. And then during the winter season I would do wrestling. And then the spring we would do outdoor track. And it's, it's something I really enjoyed. I loved being a part of a team. I love just trying to challenge myself and, and set goals and, and try to hit personal records each year. Uh, but something unique happened to me my senior year of high school. And uh, I had a great uh, cross country season, wrestling season went really well, uh, but sometime either near the end of wrestling season or just before track, uh, I was diagnosed with mono. And if you know anything about mono, it's something where you feel extremely tired all of the time. You could, you could sleep for 20 hours a day and, and still need another nap. Um, it's just exhausting. And um, I know probably some of you are thinking you, you've heard mono called uh, the kissing disease. But if you saw any of my high school pictures, you would know that there was no risk <laughs> of that, okay? <laughs> And something else with mono is that they won't allow you to do sports. And so this was a, this was a big part of my life. I really enjoyed it. And so I was, I was worried I was going to miss out on my very last season of sports in high school. I was going to miss out on track. And so I went and talked to the doctor. I, I talked to my coaches. And they actually made an exception for me because it was my senior year. Uh, but they had some limits that went along with that. And the, the main limit was that I could only run one event, and it couldn't be more than one lap at a meet. And for me, I'm, I'm a distance runner, so I would run the mile, which was four laps, and then in the same meet, I would run the two mile, which was another eight laps, and I had big plans for hitting some records that year, and, and all I could do now was just one lap. And so that's what I did. And when it came time for my race, I would run it, and I would give it everything I had, and when I got to the finish line, I would just about collapse. I would have nothing left in me at all. And, and this was really odd for me, being a distance runner. Just one lap would just completely wipe me out. And I learned something in all of that. I learned that endurance is something that when you have it, things go really smooth. It's, it's very easy to take for granted, but things go well when you have endurance. When you don't have it, you're painfully aware. And a lot of us, is prob we've probably experienced this at the run to the end 5K, right? We don't do quite the training that we need. We get out there and run, and we start really hard. And then before long, we're walking, we're huffing and puffing, and we realize we just don't have the endurance that we wish we had. And it's not just sports and athletics where endurance is important. There's a lot of areas in our life where endurance is important. If you've ever had a, a, a long-term uh, enduring friendship, there's a certain kind of endurance that's a part of that. Um, I know several adults who are going back to school to get a degree. And these are people who work either full-time or part-time. They've got a family at home. And that takes an extreme amount of endurance to be able to go back and do that. If you're a parent, you know that endurance is required for parenting. And for those of us who are Buffalo Bills fans, <laughs> that relationship requires endurance. But I don't think we really think of endurance a lot of times when it comes to our faith. What does that look like in our faith journey? Is it, is it like all the other areas where, where it's really helpful when we have that endurance and, and we're painfully aware when, when we don't? Um, what we're going to discover this morning is that endurance is extremely significant when it comes to our faith. And what's interesting is that there's one thing that's really important, that's required for endurance, that most of us tend to avoid at all cost. And so we're going to look at that this morning. What I want to do is, is look at the book of James this morning. And James has a unique perspective on this because, for one, he's, he's the brother of Jesus. And not too many of us have that title. Um, and he was also a very prominent leader in the first church. And so he was able to see uh, just uh, all the new Christians, what they were going through, all the troubles they went through, all the challenges they had. 
And so uh, in the book of James, which, which is actually a letter, this is a letter that's written to all the Christians. A lot of times in the New Testament, we'll read through letters that were written, and they're written to a specific church, but this is one that's written to all Christians. And it's helpful not just for these early Christians, uh, but it's also really helpful for us today in learning about endurance. So we're going to dive into that text, and it's James chapter 1, verse 2, just after his introduction, just after his greeting. And he says, Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. Now right here I'm like, time out. Like, Christians are, tend to be goofy enough as it is, right? We're a little quirky. And now James is telling us to find great joy whenever we have trouble. Like, that's just weird. So uh, we're going to come back to that. But he continues on and says, For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. And so... What we have right here in this, this opening portion of his letter is we have a formula for endurance. And, and not just a formula, but at the end of that formula, where I want to start is the promise that he gives. This is, this is where endurance leads. He says that when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete. Perfect and complete. And, and so I want to talk about that. We're going to come back to the endurance part, but let's talk about the promise first. So how do you know when your life is perfect and complete? I think for a lot of us, there's a couple different ways that we would use the word perfect. Uh, first of all, we would, we would use the word perfect by what we have, right? Once I have this job or that title or that girl or X amount of savings in my, my bank account or financial security or if I could just quit my job and stay home with my kids, or if I got that promotion or got into that school, then my life would be perfect. The problem is, once you have that, it's not all you thought it would be. You find out that you don't enjoy your new coworkers, or work isn't as satisfying as you thought, or there's another title that you could add after your name that would sound even better. Or you realize you need just a little bit more money than you originally thought to feel safe and secure. Or maybe you realize you don't actually enjoy staying at home with your kids 24 hours a day. <laughs> or that promotion keeps you away from your family more than before the promotion. And if the perfect life is all about what we have, then we'll find ourselves in this endless chase just trying to get the next thing, the next shiny new thing. And all of those, they quickly fade. They wear out. They're not what we thought. And there's always something more. There's always going to be another model of the iPhone. <laughs> another way that we tend to define perfect is by our lack of problems. Amy and I were uh, able to be a part of a wedding last Friday, this past Friday, and if you've ever heard a bride talk about her wedding day and describe it as perfect, um, she wouldn't describe just a list of things that went wrong, right? You wouldn't hear a bride say, it rained the whole day, my makeup ran, it was just a mess, half our guests didn't show because we didn't realize there was a misprint on the invitation, the best man couldn't find the ring for 20 minutes, the groom almost passed out, it was perfect, <laughs> right? That's not how we describe perfect. We describe perfect by lack of problems, not having challenges in our life. None of us desire to have trouble or problems in our life. And so James says that perfect isn't about what we have, and it isn't about the lack of problems. He describes perfect as something else. And, and to better understand this, the word he uses, he uses this word perfect seven times throughout this letter, and the Hebrew word for that, the Hebrew meaning would be wholeness, wholeness. And here's how James would define wholeness. Living a completely integrated life where your actions are always consistent with the values and beliefs you receive from Jesus. Let me say that again. 
this is wholeness, living a completely integrated life where your actions are always consistent with the values and beliefs you received from Jesus. And what James knows is that most of us, we live as fractured people, and we have these big and little inconsistencies, and we're compromised more than we'd like to admit. But God's desire for us is wholeness. He desires wholeness for us. And that has more to do with our character than what we have or what we can avoid. And so the goal of endurance is wholeness. The goal is wholeness. Endurance leads to wholeness. So you can chase after all the stuff in the world, and you can do your best to try to protect yourself from experiencing any trouble or difficulties. But if something is broken or missing inside of us, we're never going to feel whole. We're never going to feel perfect and complete. Because here's the thing I want you to know this morning. Wholeness isn't about getting something or avoiding something. It's about becoming something. God has much bigger plans for us than just the stuff we can acquire or trying to help us not experience anything difficult. He wants to make us whole. And what James tells us in this passage is that we arrive at wholeness through endurance. So we're going to look at how we develop endurance this morning. And first I want to talk about what endurance is not. What endurance is not. A lot of us, when we think of endurance, we tend to think of uh, not giving up, all right? And we'll stay in painful relationships or situations that most people would give up on long ago, but we're not quitters. We don't give up. I married this woman, and even though our marriage is miserable, divorce is not an option. We'll reach 50 years if it kills me. Or hopefully it kills her. <laughs> or I've been at the same dead-end job for 25 years, and every Sunday night I just get depressed because that means a whole other week at that place. But I'm not going anywhere, at least not until Social Security kicks in. I'm not quitting, all right? That's what we do. But that's not... Endurance, what that is, is stubbornness, and it's different. So I'm not recommending that anyone quit their job or walk out on their marriage. That's not what I'm saying. But James is telling us that it's not about simply not giving up. There's more to it than that. It's not so much that we struggle with giving up. It's that we struggle with giving in. We don't struggle with giving up. We struggle with giving in. And here's what I mean by that. Not giving up has to do with getting something or getting somewhere. Not giving in has to do with our character. So if we think perfect is about gaining something desirable or avoiding something uncomfortable, then we'll focus on not giving up. But if we think perfect is about becoming something, then we'll focus on not giving in. It's inside of us. And God loves you just the way you are. It's like any parent. You love your kids just the way you are, but he loves you too much to leave you where you are. He wants to do something in you. He wants to make sure that you're mature and complete. He wants you to be perfect and whole. And so how do we develop endurance? How do we develop it? There's, there's three things that James tells us in this passage that are required to develop endurance. And the first thing is trouble. Trouble. Good news, right? The first thing is trouble. Trouble reveals where your heart is at. Trouble reveals what's not perfect in your heart. And if you're, you're a parent, you know this. If you have kids, they tend to reveal things in your heart. I remember when Jake was just a little guy, our son. He's 14 now and taller than me, but when he was about half my height, uh, I was doing something in the garage when I noticed this big, long scratch on the side of our van. And I kind of had a hunch where it might have come from. So I approached Jake and I said, do you, do you know anything about this scratch on the van? And to my surprise, he actually, he told me what happened. He said, I, I was riding my bike and the handlebar caught the side of the van and it just put that scratch in it. And I was really surprised that he told me that. And so I, like, I wanted to encourage that honesty in him. I said, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm so thankful you told me that. That's like awesome. 
and I, I care more about your honesty than that scratch. And he said, oh, like he got this big smile on his face. And he said, well, then you should probably know both cars were parked in the garage and I was trying to drive between them so there's the exact same scratch on the other car. <laughs> and that just kind of revealed some things that were going on in my heart. If you want to reveal some things going on in your heart, just plan, uh, don't give yourself enough time and plan a visit to the DMV, all right? When you're under pressure for time and you will think things that you probably shouldn't. The second thing is time, time. James says, when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So there's this growing process, this growing process. And the truth is it takes time to develop maturity and endurance. Uh, but there's a catch. It's, it's very easy to think because time is required that it's time that actually develops the endurance. It's required, but time is not the thing doing it. So I don't know if you've ever been to um, like a family event where you see extended family that you usually don't see very often. So let's say every, every three or four years you might see some of this extended family. And there's always that one person, either at a wedding or a family reunion, who is just annoying, right? They, they've got these stupid jokes they always say. They just say these things that get under your skin, and you try to limit your time with them, right? And there's, there's one in every family, and you're probably thinking of who that person is right now. And if you can't think of that person, it's probably you. <laughs> But the thing is, so you see them, you, you, you do your best to get along, and then you don't see them for quite a while, and you come back three or four years later at, at the next wedding or reunion, and they haven't changed a bit. They're still saying the same jokes nobody wants to hear. They're still just kind of getting under everybody's skin, pushing things too far, and they just haven't changed a bit. And it's because time is required, but it's not time in itself that changes us. And so, um, as we're looking at developing endurance, it doesn't matter what our age is. We can go through all through life without maturing because there's more to it than just the passing of time. And the third thing is perspective. This is really helpful with growing in our endurance. Perspective. Let it grow. James says, let it grow. Um, when Amy and I first started coming here, we noticed that there was a lot of young adults who started attending, and so we wanted them to get connected in our church family, and we started the young adult ministry. And one of the big events that we did in those first couple of years was we took the whole group on a whitewater rafting trip uh, up to Black River. And I can remember as we were going down the river in our raft, we had a lot of young adults with us, and the guide would give us instructions every time we would approach the next set of rapids. And uh, they started off pretty easy, and they would get increasingly more difficult. And we came across the last set of rapids, which was like uh, a whole other class. And the name of the rapids was called the Cruncher. And what was unique about this was you had the water going down, downstream, but because of this rock formation, uh, there was a section underneath that where water would actually come from the opposite direction upstream, and it would come together at this point, which they called the cruncher. And so you would navigate your raft into that, and it was so much water, it would just like grab your raft and try to pull it under, and it was chaos. And so heading into that, we got these instructions. And uh, he said, first of all, whatever I tell you, you have to do immediately. If I tell you to paddle this way or that way, you gotta do it. If I tell you to lean or move to this end of the boat, you've gotta do it, um, and hopefully we'll get through this. Uh, the next thing is, um, if you fall in the water, it's very likely someone will fall in the water. If you do, put your hands in front of your face uh, to protect your face from the rocks. Um, and also, it's helpful to be, to try to, as best you can, stay relaxed. Um, because <laughs> <laughs> if you're relaxed, the, the rapids will kind of kick you out. But if you're all tense and fight it, it tends to kick you around in there a lot more. But the good news is, if you are fighting it and you just get stuck in there, eventually you'll go unconscious, your body will relax, and it'll kick you out. 
So <laughs> we were like afraid for our lives here. And so we get in this cruncher and it's like, I, like I, the first thing that I wasn't expecting was the noise. It was like sitting between two jet engines and just tons of water and it would just grab parts of our boat and our boat would just go up like this. And the first time it did that, I saw my wife Amy just climbing on top of young adults. <laughs> And she was sitting on top of someone at the top of the boat to stay alive. And then eventually I looked over at one of the other guys in the boat. His name was Brent. I looked at him, and he's got this huge smile on his face. And he's like, his head's like thrown back, and he's just laughing his head off. And something in there just, it just clicked inside of me. And I was like, oh, yeah, this is supposed to be fun. Like, we want to do this. And it really, it just changed everything. I went from... I don't know if I lost my fear, but I went from just being like extremely scared and, and like wishing I could get out of there to just enjoying it. And perspective does that for us. It changes everything. And it's something that's really essential for developing endurance. And so what's the key here? The key is understanding that there's a problem we face. And the problem is that if trouble is something that's required for growing an endurance, it's also something that we tend to avoid at all costs, don't we? We don't want to experience trouble. We withdraw from it. We try to avoid it, whatever we can, so we don't have to go through it. And so it's really important how we respond when we face trouble. And there's three ways that we can respond. The first way is that we can assume, we assume when we face trouble. And the thing is, what we'll assume is we'll assume that maybe, maybe God caused this to happen to us. And the challenge with assuming is that um, we start to question, why, why would a loving God do this to me? Why, why is this happening? And we tend to assume because God is so good at bringing good things out of bad things that we assume he caused the bad thing to happen in the first place. But here's the truth. God doesn't have to cause a thing to redeem a thing. That's so important. So we assume. The second thing is we accuse. And this is kind of a step beyond assuming. We start to get angry. We start to accuse God for causing these things. Why are you doing this? And, and it's so easy to move into that. And what happens is bitterness will start to creep in. And that's actually an enemy of growing in our endurance. It's very hard to grow when you're bitter. Proverbs 4.23 says, Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. And so when we're facing trouble, it's very important not to allow bitterness to creep in. We have to protect our hearts. And the third thing is ask. Simply ask. Lord, what is it that you are trying to do in this season? What do you want to do in my life right now? What can you change in me? And while assuming leads to confusion... And accusing leads to bitterness. Asking leads to growth. And this is something that's it's really counterintuitive for us. Like I said, we, we, we try to avoid trouble. Um, so this isn't natural for us. And, and what I'd like to do right now is actually have our worship team come in. And I just want to give some space where we can kind of work through... Um, how we process difficult times, how, how we deal with trouble. And so I would love for you right now just to kind of think of something in your life that's difficult. What, what is one fracture in my life right now that God wants to bring wholeness to? So think of something in your life that you're going through that feels challenging Maybe it's an area that you feel some tension in. So you start to think of this situation and your shoulders just get tight. Like it's just a tense environment to be in. It's a, it's a tense season. Or maybe it's something you're frustrated with. If you find yourself saying, I wish I could change that. That's a frustrating environment. 
Or what is a situation that you're tempted to avoid or, or some place where you are withdrawing in your life? Or maybe it's something when you think of it, you feel pain. It's painful. So I'm going to ask you to just bow your heads right now. And as you're thinking about that moment, we're going to ask a question. Jesus, what is it that you want to do? What do you want to do in me? I'm not assuming that you caused this to happen. I'm not accusing you of, of causing this trouble. But I am asking, Lord, what do you want to do? God wants to speak to you. And somebody needs to hear this this morning. God wants to speak to you. He has something to say to you. And maybe you've just been perceiving these times of trouble as God closing the door or turning his back on you. But he has a desire to make you whole. And when... Sometimes when we think about what God wants to do and he shares something with us, it can feel uncomfortable. And anytime if, if you start working out, your muscles start hurting because you haven't used them before. But when you're in shape, they don't hurt anymore. So maybe God is doing something new in you. Well, maybe you're thinking, you don't understand my situation. That's easy for some problems. I could handle losing a job. I could handle a, a broken friendship, but I can't handle this. It's all good for the little stuff, but what about the big stuff? And you know what? You're right. I don't understand. I'm well aware that there are some troubles that people in this very room are going through that I have no idea if I could ever handle that. I'm afraid it might completely break me. In fact, there are some things I know people have gone through that would completely break me. But I also know that that's not where Jesus wants to leave us. He doesn't want to leave us broken. In fact, he was broken for us. He gave his life for us so that we never have to be alone. And here's what I can tell you. I've seen some people in our church family walk through some of the darkest moments that you could possibly imagine with such grace that I can't help but see Christ in them. Do I think that God caused that heartbreaking thing to happen in their life? Not for a second. But do I think that God can do something and is doing something in that? Absolutely. And that inspires me to have the kind of rock-like faith that I see in them, that no matter what season I'm going through, I can trust in God. Our confidence is not in our ability to not be fractured. Our confidence is that when we are fractured, God is able to redeem us. What stops us won't stop him. And so what if we could turn every difficult situation, every trouble in our life into a positive experience? What if we could look back at bad memory after bad memory and instead we'd identify that with growth after growth? Instead of looking back and wishing we could forget season after season, we could look back and remember loving moment after loving moment from God. That's not the season I couldn't find a job. That's when God helped me grow in trust. That's not a story about how my uncle and I fought. That's when Christ taught me how to control my anger. It's not a story about a strained season in our marriage. That's when Jesus helped me identify some areas that I was being really selfish. And he helped to move me from selfish to selflessness. That's not a season when I hated my job. That's when God helped me discover 
a calling and a purpose for my life. So maybe James isn't crazy after all when he says we can find joy in any kind of trouble. He's not telling us to find joy because of the trouble. He's telling us to find joy because of what God can do in that trouble. So take joy in any kind of trouble because that's when God does his best work. And so, Father, this is not natural for us. Lord, we so want to pull away whenever there's something difficult going on in our lives. Or even worse, we start to blame and and just get frustrated with you, Lord. But this morning instead, we lean in. And our desire is to hear from you what you want to do in us, Lord, because we know you want to make us whole. And sometimes we're just blind to what you're doing, Lord. But you came to give the blind sight. And so, Lord, we just pray that you just take those scales off our eyes. Allow us to see what you're doing. Allow us to partner with you and have a new perspective and to grow and mature and be made whole, Lord. We thank you for your love and your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you please stand and worship with me?